Once in a few years, there will come by a TV show, movie, or game that breaks barriers for a generation. All the stars will align one day where something will come by, creating a work of art where every piece of its creation is perfect. In 1994, we were given The Lion King, a movie that in 20 years will still be talked about and will be passed down to future generations. In 2008, Breaking Bad showcased the boundaries that could be broken in television where multiple episodes have been the candidate for being the best episodes in television history. Then we also have 1980 with Empire Strikes Back, 2014 with Whiplash, 2020 with Everything Everywhere All At Once, 2023 with Across the Spider-Verse, and it'll just keep going. And once that product is created, it simply can't be made again. It can't be as perfect as it once was. But does it have to be? I ask this because Netflix's Avatar has only been out for a few weeks. And holy fuck. Okay, so obviously I'm a little late on this video. So, um, here's just a little recap on the uh, three months I've been gone. So, uh, I rewatched all of Avatar Last Airbender, ironically enough. Uh, I finished Baldur's Gate 3 on honor mode and got the golden dice. And now I barely play Baldur's Gate 3 anymore. Uh, oh, oh yeah, I also finished Invincible, uh, watched all both seasons. It's a really good fucking show. I don't know if I'm going to actually do a video on it, but I just really liked it. I went to C2E2. I, uh, I got some cool pictures of cosplayers I don't know. And then I also rewatched all of Legend of Korra. Which I can now confidently say that everybody on Twitter are fucking liars. Because they all said that Korra is responsible for resetting the Avatar lifeline. When that's a complete lie. And that was done by... Unalak and not Korra herself. So this is why you should just stay away from Twitter. I think there was some criticism about this show worth mentioning, but a lot of people hate the show because, well, they wanted to hate it. I will never take any of the people who say that Shyamalan's avatar is better seriously. I don't think people really understand how unwatchable that garbage is. So here's just a little reminder Okay, so I'm not gonna beat a dead horse and talk about the effects or the acting or things like that, so... And, uh, this is the first conversation Aang has with the guitar, and it's super fucking awkward. Don't even know his name. And, uh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, um... Cut! Yep, that's it. The scene just cuts. The scene just decides it's over and cuts to something completely different. This is a common thing throughout the entire movie, but if I were to show everything, this segment will be way too long. So just know that this movie has way too many unnecessary cuts. So this isn't something that is really brought up about this movie, is that there is no sense of direction because we're about 12 minutes in the movie and this is the first we're ever hearing about the Fire Nation starting the Hundred Year War. Didn't even get in the opening credits, just... This is the first time we're ever hearing about how the Fire Nation started the war. Not even stating the reason why. 15 minutes of the movie, and this is the first we're hearing Aang's name. Can I just say that you know a movie is really bad when you have that one line that just lives in your head rent free, all for the wrong reasons? Because this line right here just exemplifies the entire movie and how the entire cast is throughout the movie. A child wearing a costume. Honestly, it feels like every single character is like a child wearing a costume. <laughs> oh boy, this is a good one. So, here we have Sokka trying to talk about how to actually save the villages from the Fire Nation. The weakest towns and villages. And all of a sudden, Aang goes... I need to tell you something. Just completely stopping the conversation like, Oh, okay, I guess we're done with this conversation now. Um... I just, the, the problem is that this movie always wants to be done with. It just wants to have a scene and then completely cut to a new scene. There's no transition into a new scene. There's no direction. It's just all a bunch of clips thrown into one without any nice flow to it. Okay, so I skipped a lot of the movie because I didn't want to talk about it, but, um... This is the climax of the movie, and Aang is remembering Monkey Yatso because he's sad. I'm not. I'm not really sure. It's never clear why this scene is here, but this is somehow enough for him to go into the Avatar state. Yay! 
And this is when I think they're actually gonna do something cool, because, you know, Aang's prepping a tidal wave, he's about to drop on the firebenders, and they just retreat, and Aang just lets go of the tidal wave. I don't know why they did this. I guess it has something to do with Aang being pacifistic, but boy, it should be a shame if the firebenders looked over the shoulder and realized that the tidal wave's gone, and then just turned around, heading back to the Avatar, who was now weakened, and a weakened Water Tribe, potentially taking over the rest of the Water Tribe. I could talk so much more about this movie, but general sense is that this film fails in every single aspect of film. It has bad editing, bad acting, no sense of direction, and if you don't know the story of Avatar, you won't know a single thing that's happening. They want you to be but if you Avatar. are a fan of Avatar, this movie will piss you off because of how much it butchers the story. Like, it removes so much more than the recap of the Ember Island players. And it's just... I, I don't... You know, the, the whole point of being an adaptation is supposed to be adding more, but this movie somehow adds less. It, it somehow removes things to make it less cohesive of an adaptation as a film. So, um, th that's my TED talk. Alright, uh, back to the video now. All of that aside, is Netflix's Avatar really worth watching? Even if it is, is it good enough to stand with the original Avatar? The short answer, well, depends on who you ask. I think there's a lot about this show worth exploring both good and bad. So the long answer to this question is... I'm just gonna get this out of the way before I continue. The original Avatar is perfect to me. It's been a part of my childhood for the longest time. I have continued to rewatch it over and over again throughout the years. I was even a part of the squadron that witnessed the horrors of waiting an entire year for season three to come out after season two's cliffhanger. I dabbled on some of the comics, not that I remember most of it, watched it again with the Nickelodeon commentary, watched Korra once or twice, and yes, I even watched the 2010 movie in theaters, probably the worst experience I've ever had, next to Rise of Skywalker and Super Pets, mainly because I watched Super Pets alone. And while I firmly believe that changes or additions are supposed to be made to make a good adaptation into live action, the idea of adapting it at all hasn't always stood right with me. But I will say, there are a lot of choices made throughout the show that made the show way more compelling than I originally thought. The main change being with Aang's story. So, the core of the season is about Aang learning responsibility, discipline, and knowing what it means to be the Avatar. And how they strengthen this idea is introducing the past Avatars. They use the wisdom and knowledge to provide hurtful but helpful advice to Aang about what he needs to be the Avatar. The idea of being alone and to let go of all of his attachments to put the world needs first has been drilled into him this whole season. First with Avatar Kyoshi, but then mainly with Kuruk at the end of the season. And I gotta say, I love seeing more of these past Avatars, especially Kuruk. We pretty much got nothing from him in the original, so having him be more of a character, sharing his past experience as the Avatar, did help strengthen the core theme of the show. And my god, did I love when Kyoshi took over Aang's body. It not only makes for such a cool-ass showcase of the Avatar state, but there's also the little bit of fear that comes with seeing this. Not only is this the consequence of Aang not learning control, it also shows us how much power Aang can hold if he learns to accept it, something he's never been able to do. He's always been afraid that his power has forced him to be lonely, especially how he was trained with his whole life at the Air Temple to control his power. So seeing all this power that he can control still worries him, because of what that might entail. To be alone forever. To let the power to kill overcome him. So throughout the whole season, he's rejected his duties as the Avatar because he doesn't want to head down a path of loneliness. But as the season goes on, we clearly see the consequences of that. Not only are others in constant danger because he's off expecting the past avatars to just give him all the answers, but Katara and Sokka are putting even more danger being close to him, specifically in Spirited Away when Aang accidentally brought Sokka and Katara in the spirit world with him. This adds a lot more to Aang's fear of having his friends alongside him while he figures out how to be the avatar. Because if the avatar can do so much to put his friends in danger, can he inadvertently hurt them as well? This adds to a lesson that the past avatars have been trying to teach him and to let go of his attachments. Because after all, the avatar must bear their burden alone. And there's been good reason for all of the past avatars to believe that. It's even good reason for Aang to believe that. 
which is why he finally gives in to the duties of the Avatar in the finale. He lets the Moon Spirit take over him to save the Northern Water Tribe, but at the cost of his humanity. What makes this even better is that this isn't seen as character growth for Aang. This isn't the lesson he wanted to learn, but the lesson he felt like he needed to learn. I should have been lost a hundred years ago. This isn't my time or my world. I couldn't save my world, but I can save this one. It's only through Katara's words and the memory of Gyatso that he's able to understand that he might not be the avatar that the world expects him to be, but he's going to be the avatar he wants to be. Overall, Aang had a really well-rounded character arc this season. I think the show does a good job at telling this familiar story in a compelling and unique way. Utilizing the past avatars along with adding more behind Aang's powers and his life with the Air Nomads makes this story really compelling. And you can tell that his way of being the avatar has really paid off, specifically through his interaction with Zuko. This one interaction about the expectations laid upon both of them and how it changed their lives for the better or worse is such a small yet important addition to their dynamic. It connects the two in such an interesting way, but it also makes Zuko such a sympathetic character. Because while he's expected of so much and he feels like he needs to capture the Avatar to return home and take his place as Fire Lord, is that the life he really wants? I absolutely love everything with the Fire Nation in this show. There's so much emphasis on the effects that the Hunted Gear War has had on the world. People have lost hope, more has been broken across all the nations, and we get to see the cruelty and unforgiving nature behind Ozai and Sozin's want to capture the Avatar. But the war has affected Zuko and Iroh the most during the time, especially during their exile. Now, let me just start off by saying that Daos Liu and Paul Sung Kyung are the best actors of the show next to Gordon Cormier especially when it comes to Dallas's performance. He has all the pain and desire for his father's love that Zuko has, but he is also very cartoony and over the top with his reactions. He ran! We'll live in my head rent free, and this is unironically the best delivery in the whole show. But I think he's at his best when he's portraying the innocence that young Zuko has had during the flashbacks, and how that childish nature bleeds into how Zuko is now. Acting aside, I think that they both bring a lot of the character of Zuko and Iroh, as you can really feel the connection between the two. Iroh's line of telling Aang that he owes Zuko everything feels very deserved, because while Zuko may be quick to anger to Iroh at times, he ends up prioritizing Iroh above anything else on several occasions. Zuko could have very easily tried to go off the Avatar after Aang and Iroh were captured. Instead, he chose to save Iroh instead. But most importantly, Zuko was there for Iroh when nobody else was. Not even his own brother. When my studies weren't going well, and father was unhappy, Lu Ten gave me this. He'd won it for finishing first in his officer class. Oh my god, I hate that I cried here. But I love this scene nonetheless. Zuko decided to show vulnerability and real compassion to Iroh, fully knowing that his father, the man he looked up to his whole life and put above everybody else, was in the same room. Zuko decided that in that moment, that Iroh was the most important person in that room, and sat with him while him and Iroh mourned over Lu Ten. So Iroh returned that favor, by being there for Zuko and supporting him when nobody else will. Iroh knows that Zuko is struggling to find his own path, and knows that he'll eventually find it with his support. Because of this moment right here, where Zuko made his own choice, based off his own emotions and heart. And especially because of the sacrifice that he made when he was banished by Ozai. The decision to make the 41st to visit Zuko's crew, which is the same crew Zuko stood up for when Ozai was willing to sacrifice them, is by far the best choice in this entire show. It makes Zuko's banishment all the more compelling as he sacrificed everything about his life to save the people that aboard his crew, who originally scolded him for never caring. Zuko was the only one who actually cared about the lives of the Fire Nation's men, when even Ozai didn't. Because the Fire Nation has now resorted to underhanded tactics throughout these hundred years. Nothing matters to Ozai anymore except winning the war and capturing the Avatar. Everybody else be damned. And that's how Zuko's crew welcomed him back as their Prince of the Fire Nation. Ozai is absolutely ruthless in this show. Not only because of how willing he is to sacrifice so many of his men for the sake of his glory, but also because of just how much of a terrible father he is. Granted, Ozai has always been a terrible dad, but we get to see more of that through Azula. The main thing about Azula in this season is that we get to see her try and slither her way into convincing Ozai into letting her capture the Avatar herself. And the way she does that is by using Zhao as a means to make herself look better. 
Because if she can make such an unexperienced, weak, and pathetic man like Zhao look like a true commander, then surely she's able to go out and take Zuko's place herself. Of course, Zhao being the pathetic man that he is firmly believes that he's the one gaining all the power here, but Azula is really the one pulling all the strings. And yet, no matter how hard she tries, it was never enough. Because Ozai manipulates Azula into believing that she needs to try harder to gain his respect and love. A lot of people are really torn about the scene where Ozai praises Zuko, making Azula look worse. But the thing is, Ozai isn't really praising Zuko here. He's only doing it to force Azula to try harder. It's so interesting to see Ozai try to use such dirty tactics against kids to constantly try to fight for his appreciation. First with Zuko, and here with Azula where he basically says, you need to be more like your brother. Of course he doesn't mean it. He's just saying this as a way to have Azula do better. And that's he does, as all the frustration about not being perfect enough for Ozai pushes her to bend lightning. Both Azula and Zuko have been tormented and mentally abused by Ozai. The only difference is, is that Azula is fucking crazy and she would use that abuse as a motivator to be evil as shit. Because Azula lives by Ozai's word. And his word is lived by the Fire Nation. Victory or defeat? Overall, there's been quite a bit about the show that I've enjoyed. I think it has a well-rounded character arc for Aang, I love the journey he goes through, and everything regarding the Fire Nation and the characters within them is fantastic. However, this is the part of the video where I begin to run into problems. Because while the ideas of this show are great, and 7 out of 10 times they're told in such a compelling and interesting way, the other 3 out of 10 times, it's pretty bad. So congrats, Twitter bros. This is the time where you can actually sit and enjoy my video. There are some fundamental factors behind making a TV show, especially a TV show like this, that I think felt pretty flat. The main problem was definitely the pacing, because condensing about 20 episodes into 8 individual yet longer episodes was obviously going to leave the problems. The one thing the show did that I really liked was combining a couple different storylines from different episodes into one episode. Amashi was the best example, as it used characters like Jet with the Mechanist inside the episode where Aang first visits Amashu. I think that the Amashu episodes are by far the best uses of his condensed runtime, and knows how to make multiple episodes concepts flow together nicely. Though this does inevitably lead to the messages and themes behind each of those original stories not hit as hard and can be very muddied. You, you get it? Cause muddied like, like the Earth, because they're in Omashu, and mud is assumptions of Earth, and this is the city of the Earth. Besides that, there are some times where using the strategy can create an absolute dumpster fire of an episode. The first episode is especially horrible with its pacing because of how much it has to fold together in an hour. You got the intro with Aang, then the Air Nomad genocide, it's still 25 like this, Katara Taka meeting Aang, Aang getting captured by Zuko, him escaping, going to the Northern Air Temple, and holy fuck this episode should have ended half an hour ago, why is it still going? Granted, there was a lot of pressure behind this very first episode of this adaptation, but it feels like the show absolutely cracked with this first episode. Admittedly enough, the show got like three times better when Zoom passed all the pilot stuff and Grand Grand finally got done rehearsing the original intro. Even then, there's so much missed opportunity by zooming past so much so quickly. And this isn't just with the first episode either, mind you. There were times where I felt like the show just wanted to get itself over with. And this feeling is especially apparent with Aang, Katara, and Sokka. I genuinely found it hard to believe that these guys were friends until I was almost halfway through with the season. The show hardly gives these three time to just talk like normal people and not to constantly talk about the task at hand. I liked all the times the show wasn't just crashing into a statue on their air scooter and built a relationship when it came to Aang and the other characters. The problem is how scarce it was. Now, I understand that this show is meant to have a darker tone. It's supposed to be fucking depressing when Aang has to come back after 100 years to find everything is shambles. I totally vibe with that, and I think it's a great building block for the show, given how empathetic and wondrous Aang is as a character. The first 5 minutes of the show is probably some of the best 5 minutes of any TV show I've watched. It has a great hook with the intensity, the acting, and writing behind it all. It tells me what type of show it was going to be, and I was all there for it. But the constant sense of danger bleeds into the story and not feeling like it can take the time to explore any of the themes it's trying to convey. Aang talks to the spirit of the forest and spirit of the way, saying how it's in so much pain because of what the Fire Nation has done. But we really don't get anything outside this one scene to explore that spirit's pain, because Aang is forced to save his friends from Ko by traveling all the way to the Fire Nation to find out how to even defeat Ko. And don't get me wrong, I love Ko and all the stuff they did with him. But it felt like the show just didn't have enough time to explore all the smaller aspects like this because it's too focused on the larger picture. The last two episodes is the biggest contender of this flow though. Paku has no chance to be a real character here because of the looming threat with the Fire Nation. 
We never truly get to understand why he doesn't allow females to fight in the Northern Water Tribe. There's really no time to explore any of the characters from the Northern Wild Tribe aside from Yue because of how much needs to be explored in other regions of the show. I couldn't even get much satisfaction for Katara proving he's a waterbending master to Paku because he gets sidelined so much in the show and doesn't get a chance to show her strength and her confidence throughout the season. I would have loved to see more from her, like how she incorporates other bending styles into her waterbending, but that unfortunately doesn't go far. So yes, while there's a lot of times I love this show and I was able to craft him and share a story, there's so little room for the smaller things in the show to really matter. Along with the darker tale of the story, this show sometimes misses out on the fun and charm that comes along with these characters. And it can really feel like the show focuses too much on destination and not the journey. However, this huge issue of mine correlates when it tries to just tell the story of Avatar Book 1. When the episode is so dead set on keeping to the original story of Avatar Season 1, it falls extremely flat in the pacing and writing department. Okay, I'm about to open a huge can of worms with this, but I prefer when the show deviates from the original. I think that seeing a story as a guideline in our rule book is the most important thing when it comes to adaptations. So when the show went a different direction with a certain character, plotline, or just make an entirely new episode, it got a lot better for me. Going back to the Omasu episode, they're some of my favorite because it felt like an entirely new episode of Avatar. Like, I was watching a lost episode of the original animated show. I loved how Jet's character tied in nicely with the mechanics and his reasoning behind selling weapons to the Fire Nation and Omashu. And hell, that even came back to the finale, which was cool to see. I got to see more behind Iroh and his influence as Dragon of the West in Lost in the Dark, and it broke my heart seeing his time as a butcher of law laid out for him. I especially found it interesting when it came to episodes like Masks, which while very similar to the original, it used the concept of the episode to dive further into Zuko's banishment. When Zuko infiltrated the Fire Nation, dishonoring his banishment, all for the sake of capturing Aang for himself, we get to see why capturing Aang is so important to him, why he can't let all of his sacrifices be for nothing. And I'll say it again, this is the best conversation with Aang and Zuko and one of the best scenes in the entire season. This is exactly what I mean when I say the show is better when it slows down. And I will always adore Warriors because it knows exactly how to be a lighthearted while maintaining the darkest storytelling, and we get to see Suki and Sokka's relationship in a whole new light. I get that a lot of people really hate how their relationship isn't born for Sokka getting over his sexism, but I think his shift in character worked with Suki. Also, Maria Zang, if you can just like add me on my socials, uh, my Twitter handle is going to be uh, at CabbageBoy2202. My Discord is dot Cabbage Boy, and my phone number is going to be 63. As for Boomy, though, eh, okay, I thought about it for a little bit, and he isn't as bad as I thought. He is vastly different from the original, but I think given the tale of the show, it works pretty okay here. It shows what the effects of war can do to people like Boomy, who originally was just like Aang, and it takes Aang to teach Boomy that there's still hope to be made. I've already talked extensively about Aang's story in this, but I do like the more focus they gave on Gyatso here. This makes him out to be more of an important character to Aang, and it's kind of nice to see Aang struggle to learn how to live without Gyatso. This shows the impact he had on Aang growing up, and the guilt that came when Aang found out that Gyatso was killed while he was away. He even has one last conversation with them in the spirit world where Gyatso tells him straight that it's not his fault. This is one of the most heart-wrenching scenes of the season, and it's because of how much of an important figure Gyatso feels like in Aang's life. This show has shown numerous times that it can be extremely good when it tries something original. When you expect it to be exactly like the original, but takes a left turn and tells something unique while still keeping the essence of the overall story. What's now finally come to the answer of the big question. Is Netflix's Avatar worth the time? This is a really, really hard question to answer because I understand a lot of people have their stances on the show. There's tons of people that love the show and there's even tons more that despise everything about it. So trying to judge the worth of an entire show from just one person's perspective is really stressful because this isn't just any TV show I'm talking about. It's Avatar The Last Goddamn Airbender. I can't just simply say that this live action adaptation is good and absolutely works as a live action adaptation because it's Avatar. 
I also can't say that this is a complete waste of time and completely disrespects the original source material with no hope of ever getting better, because this is still Avatar we're talking about. And with that same sentiment, this show was never going to be good enough for a lot of people. If it's an exact carbon copy with no originality or deviations, people are going to despise that to cheap attempt to tell you that the live action version is the animated version substitute. And if it tries to be too original, people will constantly tell you about how it destroys the purpose behind the show entirely, and this is my favorite comment that I've seen, THIS IS WHY THE ORIGINAL CREATORS LEFT! There will always going to be people who simply hate the existence of this show. That being said, I'm not here to tell you what your opinion should be. I'm not trying to tie you to a chair, force you to watch the show, telling you it's good or bad. I'm always a firm believer that everybody's voice and vision should be heard, including the entire crew behind the show. So, um, fun little fact about the creation of this video. I was about halfway through a script with this video, talking about each episode bit by bit, explaining my individual thoughts, and I fucking scrapped it. I stopped right after Lost in the Dark. This script was really, really stressful for me to make because I know what show I'm talking about. I know that I'm presenting myself as a huge fan of the original Avatar talking about the live action adaptation. And boy, if I was stressed about merely talking about this show, imagine what the entire crew felt like simply conceiving the idea of this show. You don't just get to recreate perfection like Avatar The Last Airbender. So how do you go up to millions of fans and say, yeah, we're making this live action? How do you go about the entire creative process, writing out the story, creating the sets, down to picking who the fuck is gonna play the cabbage man, knowing that if it isn't perfect, people won't even bother watching? Simple. You don't. If the crew behind the show was in the mindset of perfectly recreating Avatar The Last Airbender live action, this show would be ten times worse. That's why they didn't recreate perfection, they just molded it into something that they wanted out of the show. Now, this wasn't excusing any of the problems I have with the show. There's way too much dialogue in the show and not enough visual storytelling, the pacing is all over the place sometimes, and the darkest sense of the story leads to some lackluster characters. However, I still say that this show is at least worth trying. Too many people nowadays take a look at this concept and write it off as ruining the original without ever needing to watch a single episode. If you're simply not interested because you'd rather watch the animated, that's totally fine. But there's a difference between ignoring the show and not watching it, but yet still telling everybody that it's a waste of the time. And that, my three fellow viewers that are still watching, is what we call gatekeeping. And if you have watched the show and decided it was still terrible, that's also fine. Criticism is always allowed, but criticizing other people for enjoying something is a whole other story. So is Netflix's Avatar worth at least watching an episode too? Absolutely. Even though I have my issue with the first episode, I still think that the cast is great and it's at least an okay building block for the rest of the season. Am I still gonna watch the animated version over this? I mean, yeah, come on, I, I love the original, I can always just go back to it if I want to. That doesn't mean that I hate the adaptation though. It overall does a good job at standing on its own two feet. When it feels pressed to be the original, it can get a little iffy, but it gets so much better when it's trying to give its own narrative twist on it. So, I'm going to give Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender a 7.5 out of 10. And thank you to the crew who made this show possible. Because I got to talk about one of my favorite TV shows of all time, which I realistically don't get a chance to do otherwise. Oh my god, that was definitely a video. I certainly hope you guys enjoyed it, and thank you to all who stuck around for the end. It was definitely tough for me to make this video, but it was something I was really passionate talking about. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the little notification bell to get notified of future content releases. Become a true Animaniac for up to $6 a month and to get special access to scripts, videos, a Patreon exclusive Discord to share your passing the same way I do, and a bunch of other neat stuff. I'm your favorite Vincible Cowboy, signing off.